Having begun by looking at the history of philosophy of mind and the birth of modern psychology, our next big topic is language. Now language is a familiar word, picks out something we're all very familiar with. Turns out it means an awful lot of different things. So when we're speaking about language, sometimes it's important to um, make sure that we know what it is that we're picking out when we use the term. Language has played a central role in the development of cognitive science since the Second World War, and theories of language became completely entangled with theories of mind in the revolution that happened after the, first, after the Second World War, once the computer metaphor came into being. Computers manipulate symbols according to rules. That's the basic way a computer operates. And theories of language, which involved the arrangement and manipulation of symbols according to rules, had been around already, but became much more explicit in the second half of the 20th century. Language has always been seen as one of those things that separates humans from other species. It shares that distinction with reason. Um, so we're going to come at the topic of language from many different angles to make it clear what a wealth of different subject matters there is here. Uh, we'll be asking what language is good for, where it came from, and more importantly, we'll be asking what do we mean by language? Because, as I said, there's several different meanings. Now, if I were to ask you why any species might be interested in having language, for example, well, the first thing that comes to mind is undoubtedly communication. Language suits our purposes because it allows us to communicate, to pass messages, to, for me to generate meanings and for me to convey those meanings to you. Now that's something that happens between people, obviously. Um, that's, while that's the first thing that comes to mind when we say language, um, shortly afterwards we may recognize that, hang on, language seems to play a role internally as well, in the manner in which we think. I don't know if you speak to yourself, some people do, I often speak to myself, myself out loud, but it's also possible to speak to yourself silently, and this relationship between an inner voice and an outer voice is something we'll look into. But crucially, when language is involved in thought or thinking, it's something one person does. Whereas when it's involved in message passing, it's something two or more people do. Now these may not be the only functions that language serves, but it's important to realize, first of all, that there's a crucial difference between something which exists between people and something which exists within people. Now, when we briefly introduce the computational turn, that is the switch that happened after the Second World War, as computers appeared on the scene and a new language of information processing became very popular, we met this guy, Jerry Fodor, whose two books, The Modularity of Mind and The Language of Thought, served to reinforce the importance of the computational metaphor of thinking about minds in a computational way. And in the language of thought, particularly, his arguments included recent developments in the science and the study of language and linguistics, um, primarily as it was being developed by Noam Chomsky at that stage. We'll meet Noam Chomsky a little bit later. Now, in this module, it'll become increasingly clear that neither mind nor thought have well-formed definitions. When we're talking about mind or thought, we're engaging in important activity, but those words, mind and thought, never have had definitions that everyone could agree on. So, we're finding ways to talk around the topics that seem to demand 
something called mind or something called thought. So when Jerry Fodor comes out and says thought is one way or another way, first of all, be a little bit skeptical because nobody has ever clearly delineated what needs to be explained when we're talking about thinking. On the other hand, it is possible that when he makes a claim here, that he is serving to uh, improve our ability to talk about one aspect of thinking. Just as aspects of mind can be further developed without ever really knowing what a mind as such is. Now, drawing on the theory of linguistics as it was being developed, Jerry Fodor argued in this book that a lot of thought is exhibits a kind of structure. And that structure is parallel or even identical to the kind of structure exhibited by sentences. So that thought is much like language or even is language. Now, a sentence like, I would like a pie, consists of words in a very specific order, and the order determines the meaning of those words. And if you're going to speak it, it takes time, and you go from the first word to the last word. Now, it's possible, probably, to want a pie without ever having a thought that's anything like a sentence. You're walking past a window. <laughs> Smells good. Grab the pie. No language involved. It is, however, possible to sit there and think, I would like a pie. The kind of thing you could find yourself muttering under your breath. And so that kind of first person, one person thinking, bears some resemblance, crucial resemblance, to language. Or so Jerry Fodor is claiming. Now he's not claiming that all of thought is of this nature. Um, and we shouldn't mistake this hypothesis for that idea. But it's worth looking into to the relationship between some ways of thinking and some structures we find in language. So here's an example of a sentence, a linguistic sentence written down there in words. But I can imagine having this as a thought. I don't know if you can imagine having this as a thought. That's for you to try out. It goes like this. If three of us sneak in the back, we can steal at least a bag of apples without getting caught. I'm imagining a scenario in which myself and my friends in younger years are planning to rob some apples from an orchard. And we're making a plan. And you can imagine being, I hope you can imagine being outside the orchard and coming up with a plan like this. Whether you put it in words or not, this plan has certain aspects to it that a creature without language probably wouldn't be able to have. So let's have a look at some aspects of this uh, sentence as it is now. First of all, it has a number in it. There's three of us. It has a conditional in it. If we do this, then that would happen. Now that requires you to think about or reason about not unreal situations. We haven't snuck into the orchard yet. We might and might not get caught, or we might and might not steal the apples. But all those are hypotheticals. They're counterfactuals. So the ability to have at your disposal a plan like this seems to suggest an ability to think about situations which are not actual, real, and present. It's unclear that an animal might be able to do that. There are quantities involved. A bag of apples, at least a bag of apples. That's a very indeterminate quantity, but it's a useful way of thinking. So whether this was ever explicitly stated by me and my friends before we went to rob the orchard, I think you can see that when we lay it out as a sentence, it seems to contain a lot of the complexities of thought. Counterfactuals, number quantities, approximate quantities. Um, so the question is, could, if you didn't have language, would you be capable of making a plan like this? Or is language absolutely central to this activity? Well, I don't know the answer, nor does Jerry Fodor. But he put it out there that one way to come at the many things we mean when we say thinking is to think of thoughts that are like sentences. And he even came up with a word for this called mentalese, 
much like uh, Chinese or Japanese, mental these as a language of thought. And this is, of course, an inner language, and it's something used by one person on their own. And so you have, you, you're, you're capable of doing experiments now. You can ask yourself about, does this ring true for you? Do you sometimes have thoughts that are language-like? Do you sometimes have thoughts that might as well be spoken out loud? And if so, are they in English? Perhaps you're multilingual. They may be in one language or, or in another language. If your thoughts are clearly in one language or in another language, then that's evidence that they're language-like. But if you have a thought like that, how much does it resemble, let's say, a spoken sentence? Does it have a voice? Is it your voice? Or could you imagine having a thought in someone else's voice? Like groundskeeper Willie in The Simpsons, for example, who has a heavy Scottish accent. Could you think like groundskeeper Willie? And, and if language and thought are so closely related, what's happening when you're reading? Is reading a form of thinking? Is reading Does reading generate an inner simulation of the sound of the words? I don't know the answers to these questions, but they're questions that are available to you when we start to think like this. What I've tried to do is make these relevant to the language of thought hypothesis. This opens up the door to a lot more questions. What do we mean by a thought anyway? I don't know if you've ever considered this, and I don't think it's wise to try to reach a definite answer, but to wonder, when we speak about thinking, what are we speaking about? Does it come in different kinds? Are thoughts necessarily expressed in word? Uh, or is it the case, as I suggested with my robbing the orchard plan, that having words and sentence structures available to you allows you to think things that you couldn't think otherwise? And it, does the word thought work for you? Would you be comfortable describing your mental life as thought? I don't want to answer these questions. I want to pose them to you just to get a feel for what happens when we start to consider language and thought together. Now, if we encounter a debate in the wild between philosophers or linguists, and they're using words like language or thought, it might be worthwhile to take a moment to wonder what they mean by thought or what they mean by language. People use words confidently, but often we have to do some work to figure out what they actually mean. Now, this language of thought hypothesis, which suggests that some aspects of thinking are very language-like in nature, it takes a strong view of what language is and how it's related to thought and to what we might call cognition. And let's say planning to rob an orchard looks like a good example of cognition. Now, in the emerging vocabulary of computational thinking and the kind of linguistics that was going on, we find a great deal of uh, imagination inflamed by the idea of having symbols which have some kind of meaning, can be interpreted based on their order, words in a sentence, for example, and rules which allow you to manipulate the symbols in some way, not in any arbitrary way, but manipulate the symbols, thereby changing the meaning. So if we say John kicked the ball, we get one meaning, and if we say the ball kicked John, we get another meaning. Okay. Now computers, as I said, contain patterns of ones and zeros, which are essentially symbols. They can be interpreted as being about something, they're not inherently about something, but they can be interpreted that way. And when they, we do so, we say that they, they are symbols which represent something. And words in written language are an example of this as well. well the language of thought hypothesis suggests that some forms of thinking, some forms of mental process, are computational processes defined over representations. The representations in this case are symbols that stand for something. They're about something, but of course they need to be interpreted. And their meaning will depend on what other symbols they co-occur with and how 
what kind of rules we can bring to bear to transform sequences of symbols. That's what computation ultimately comes, to, comes down to. So you can see that Jerry Fodor is thinking here in a way that is going to become central to the computational theory of mind, a theory of mind that's by far the most popular theory of mind these days, but is by no means the only theory of mind. So we'll be coming back to these ideas a little bit later, and another thing we'll be coming back to is this, what we've uncovered here is a relationship between what goes on silently inside for one person and this more public form of speaking in which people converse. So the inner voice and the outer voice will need to be considered together when we get to consider the development of the child. So that's to warm us up.